The Wheat School on realagriculture.com is brought to you by Alberta Grains, CNM Seeds, and Syngenta Canada. Find more episodes of The Wheat School by going to wheatschool.com. Hi, I'm Bernard Tobin. Welcome to The Wheat School. Today, we're going to talk about nutrient uptake in wheat and how the availability and uptake of key macronutrients impacts how growers should manage winter wheat. For that discussion, I am pleased to be joined by real agriculture agronomist Peter Wheat Pete Johnson. Hi, Pete. Hey, thanks for dropping by. Thanks for having me, Bern, and I'm really excited about this research. It's been a long time coming, and I, a huge shout out to my research technician, Shane McClure. He's the guy that that drove the whole process, and then we've got a bunch of people along the way. Dave, Dr. Dave Hooker, uh, Josh Naselski has come on board, a, Dr. Adrian Carendo, who's the new guy at University of Guelph running some cool stats on the data, and uh, also Justin Belair is helping out with some of it. So, so a big team putting this together, Grain Farmers of Ontario, big funding partners, Middlesex Soil and Crop, couldn't do it without them. But yeah, it we haven't had this data. So it's so cool to actually have some data to talk about and to fine tune growers fertilizer applications based on better science. Mm. Now, Hey, let's start it right here. Is it correct to say that we know a lot more about nutrient uptake in crops like corn and soybeans than we do about wheat? Yeah. And I think the answer, certainly from an Ontario standpoint, I think even from a North American standpoint or the Eastern seaboard, at least the answer is absolutely yes. So Dr. Ross Bender did some super work on both corn and soybeans when he was doing his PhD and he published all these great graphs and they're, they're out. Uh, you can get, see them on the, on the internet almost anywhere. And they look at, you know, when does the plant take up nutrients and where does it go in the plant? And that was actually what what challenged me because we didn't have that data for wheat in a high yield environment like we have here in Ontario, in Michigan, in, you know, kind of the Great Lakes Basin. And so it was, wow, that's, that's cool stuff. Somebody should do that for wheat. And so if somebody should do that for wheat, it's probably me because who else is going to do that? So we spent three years pulling this together. And I think we now can match corn and soybeans with, with the level of information to support grower decisions. Awesome. Now, I mean, there's a lot here. Uh, I want to dig into it. So, um, of course, the conversation has to start with nitrogen. You know, what did you learn about N, when it's taken up by the plant and when it needs to be available to the crop? Yeah, so great question, Bern. And what really is interesting is we we included different classes of wheat because when you talk nitrogen, well, here in Ontario, we grow soft white, we grow soft red, but we also grow hard red. Hard red is higher protein. And, and so you go, wow, so I need protein. Typically, uh, nitrogen uptake for protein, we think, was later in the in the growth of the wheat crop than it is for the soft uh, soft class. And so we looked at five different varieties, two hard reds, the other three were softs, one of them soft white, all the same, all the same, no differences whatsoever. And that in itself was astounding in terms of how that, that plant responds. And so we look at nitrogen and the uptake is actually considerably faster than what I expected. So when you look at this nitrogen uptake chart, we have 35 pounds of nitrogen already in the wheat crop at the beginning of stem elongation and that is a bigger number than i expected because at that point it's just it's just a very small plant got a bunch of tillers but it's all leaves there's no stem whatsoever and we already had 35 pounds in the wheat crop and we hit stem elongation and this is true in the corn crop as well that's the rapid growth phase and so you see that that uptake just you know it's really going up fast in fact three pounds per acre per day is sort of at its maximum and and that's a big number and what it tells us is that we can't short the wheat crop for nitrogen early and, and we knew that we knew we needed to have a good portion of it there, but 50% by second node in the crop. And for a lot of Ontario, that second node is 10th, 15th of, of May. Man, 
that first shot of nitrogen, it better be big because it's got to support a lot of uptake very, very rapidly. And then you get to 85% uptake by anthesis by the time it, the wheat crop heads out. Well, that that is quite a bit different than corn. The corn data is that we still have about 38% of the nitrogen to be taken up by the corn crop post tassel, which is the same thing, post anthesis, we only have 15% of the nitrogen goes into the wheat crop. And so in terms of how a grower looks at this data and uses this data, it, it just says, okay, we, we have to manage lodging. And so there's some things we do around nitrogen to, to manage lodging as well. But if we don't have enough nitrogen up front, man, we are going to starve that crop through its rapid uptake phase. So the big shot really does have to be, you know, kind of prior to May 1st, uh, you know, even in some areas prior or by April 20th, April 15th, if we can get across the ground. And we're actually going to shave back those later nitrogen applications because there's so little uptake. I mean, 70% in by flag leaf stage. So 30% is still something to go in, but you apply it on the soil surface. It's got to get into the soil before that plant can pick it up. This says the big shot first, and, and it actually makes managing the crop a tad easier in terms of we always worry about leaf burn with 28% when we put it on late. So, so lodging a bit more issue, but we have growth regulators now, and, and maybe we rely on them a bit more. And our nitrogen management, we just fine-tune it that much better. Yeah. So there's some advice for growers this spring uh, on nitrogen management. Hey, let's talk about phosphorus. Um, now, this is a much different story than nitrogen, especially when it comes to the speed and pace of pea uptake. Yeah, and so absolutely, and, and I maybe should have started, Burn, when I look at this graph, I say, okay, I should have mentioned that the green on the graph are the leaves, the brownish color are, is the stem, the blue is the grain. And so when you look at that, you know, how you interpret this data, where the data, where the the nutrients go. What's really interesting, this phosphorus curve, there's a couple of things that are really interesting, but notice the amount of mobilization of the phosphorus that is in the leaves and in the stem and how that remobilizes during grain fill and transfers into the grain. We get 90% of the phosphorus that the plant picks up is taken off in the grain. And so that, like, that's a big number in terms of, of plant removal. But you look at the slope of that line, burn, and I had no clue about this. I am, I am the poster child for put phosphorus with the wheat seed. Wheat is a phosphorus hog. In the fall, there are three things that are important about growing winter wheat. It's phosphorus, phosphorus, and phosphorus. How many times have I said that? No, once or twice. And then I look, at this, I look at this graph. She's a straight line all the way through to maturity. I, I had no idea. And it, it's sort of in that you know, 0.2 pounds per acre per day. And yes, the soil can supply a whole lot. But when I look at that, and a lot of grain samples that we look at, based on the the UK data, the, the English data, we, we are probably deficient in the grain in phosphorus. And I look at how this uptake, we start off with, you know, uh, something less than 5% of the phosphorus in the crop at that at the beginning of stem elongation that's amazing phosphorus uptake all the way through i wonder and i don't know because we haven't tried enough but i wonder if we shouldn't look at phosphorus application in the spring to see if we can support that uptake and and maybe push yields a little higher or at least you know make the grain a little higher in phosphorus concentration it's a really interesting question so uh, you're saying we probably should think about somehow supplementing phosphorus in season? What I'm saying, Bern, is that this is the next research project because I don't know if it will have the impact we want it to, but I didn't know that the plant continued to take it up right through to maturity. Man, we got we to gotta figure it out. So mm -hmm. I'm, not, I'm not telling growers to do it. I, I'm telling growers, do it on a plot basis and see what happens. And in particular, do it on a low phosphorus soil test, because if anything should pay, that's where it should pay. Now, let's talk potassium. Um, you know, the research indicates that 
you know, uptake here is early, 100% uptake by Anthesis. Um, did that surprise you? Blew my brains. Man, Baird, I just, like... How can this even be? Physiologically, how does this happen? I don't understand it. And, and some people have said, because if you look at this graph, right, 100% uptake by Anthesis. And after that, after the wheat heads out, it's dumping phosphorus. It's letting phosphorus go, or pardon me, potash rather. It's letting potash go. And some people have said, well, the leaves are dying off. Well, okay. The leaves might be dying off. And so if you look at the green, yeah, they're dying off. You can see that the potash is, and as they die, the potash leaches out of them. Fair. But even the stem, the stem is not dying off. And the stem is losing potash as well. And you just look at that. And so, man, you better have good good potash levels. The chances of getting response to spring applied potash are very low because it just doesn't get a chance to become available. It doesn't move that quickly in the soil. And so we have not seen much yield response to potash in the spring. Uh, wheat doesn't respond well to potash, full stop. That's what the data says. And this sort of explains why. By the time it, it, you know, the potash gets to be more available, yeah, the wheat crop's already got everything it needs. And, and by the way, the uptake is pretty significant, like up to four pounds per acre per day if, 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 at maximum uptake. And, and that's, that's a lot going fast. Yeah. Hey, let's wrap it up with sulfur. Now, every year we see sulfur deficiency in the wheat crop. You know, some fields, somewhere, you know. Um, Pete, when is the plan taking up that sulfur? And, and are we, you know, making enough available? You know, Sean, absolutely. This one, is it, it resembles nitrogen very closely, which makes good sense because the two are related in the plant, in the protein. But with this, the sulfur uptake is even faster. So, you know, we had 70% in by flag leaf and nitrogen. We have 72 by flag leaf and in, in sulfur. By anthesis, instead of 85, it's 91%. The answer is put your sulfur on early. We don't lose it. I mean, if you're getting response, putting on a, a little bit on later, okay. But this clearly supports that we need the sulfur early. And don't short yourself in the early going because – and it just that's when it that's when the crop needs it so get yeah. it on early now this looks like a really early spring pete i know it's a dangerous thing to say late february um what does that mean for sulfur sulfur application for the 2024 crop you know what's really interesting about sulfur is that it's not at as much risk of loss as the nitrogen is so i actually have had some growers already in february and i you know it's pretty early but but down down in chatham kent on nice soil, I had one grower went out and he put his ammonium sulfate on on the weekend. So it's not much nitrogen. It's kind of looking at about 20 pounds of nitrogen. It's not a high risk of nitrogen loss. But now he's got 24 pounds of sulfur there, which is you know ample, mm. and, and it's already out there. And if it happens to get wet, he can't get back in the field. He's got some nitrogen there to kind of keep that plant going. So from a, a sulfur standpoint, I sort of like this this concept of split applied nitrogen. There's some other good things about split applied nitrogen. So we get that sulfur on early, either with you know the first shot of 28 with ammonium thiol sulfate, or as as this grower did, maybe just straight ammonium sulfate or urea plus ammonium sulfate, and and doing that in good time, I think just supports the sulfur uptake and that early nitrogen uptake as well. Well, Pete, hey, some great stuff here. Um, hey, now we're only scratching the surface of the research today. Where do, where do you take it from here? You know, when and where can growers learn more? Yeah, so, uh, I mean, certainly we've been presenting this this data this winter, so get out to a meeting. If you're part of the Ontario Ag Conference, the, the session is on the website there. I presented actually this data for, for the Michigan growers last week, and that uh, session was recorded as well. So So it's out there on the web. It's also up on the Grain Farmers website. The, the report is there. The published paper isn't available quite yet. It will be. And look for sometime in the future, we're going to come out with a fancy publication like Ross Bender did for corn and wheat and soybeans, rather. And we're going to put wheat on the map. Hey, thank you, Pete. Um, any parting words for growers? Absolutely, Vern. Grow great wheat. <laughs>